Hi, everybody, and welcome to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. Well, this week has just flown by. It's been hot and muggy with some thunderstorms thrown in the mix. Um, I've been going on bike rides most mornings, and on days when I don't do that, I've been walking. My friend Kathy and I have been going uh, bike riding about 20 miles a day. And when I'm walking, I go probably three miles or so. So I'm trying to get back into shape. Something that I've meant to talk about for the past uh, couple of videos is that I picked up the Eclipse stamps at my local post office last month on the day they were released. You might remember that I mentioned these in a video a few months ago. They are the first stamps to use um, thermochromic ink, which changes the picture on the stamp. Um, so the original picture on the stamp is the eclipse itself. Basically, you can only see the sun's corona and then the shadow of the moon in the middle. But if you place your thumb on the stamp, the picture changes from the plain dark shadow to the moon. And then when it cools down, it goes back to the black shadow again. It's pretty neat. These stamps were released on June 21st, and that day I went right down to the post office as soon as they opened at 8.30 in the morning. And I was so worried that someone was gonna beat me to the post office and, and buy all the Eclipse stamps. <laughs> but when I got there, not only was I the only customer, but they hadn't even brought those stamps out of the vault. So I actually had to wait while the postmaster went and got them out of the vault and scanned them into the computer for inventory. So, um, and then she only got a hundred of them. Um, I was going to buy a hundred, but I didn't want to be a stamp hog. So I only got like 40 of them, but I was really excited to get my hands on the Eclipse stamps and be the first person in town to have them. Now, as a reminder, the Eclipse stamps were released in honor of the upcoming total eclipse of the sun that will be seen across the United States on August 21st. It will be the first time that we'll have seen a total eclipse since 1979. Here is a visual of the path of the eclipse. As you can see, it goes from the Pacific Northwest down to the southeastern states. It starts at 10.15 a.m. local time in Oregon and ends at 3 p.m. local time in South Carolina. The closer you are to the direct path, the more of the total eclipse you'll be able to see. And the farther away you are, the more of a partial eclipse you'll see. I'm in Illinois and we are pretty close to the direct path, so we should see over a 90% covering of the sun. So we should have a pretty good view here if it's not cloudy. <laughs> so yeah, get yourself ready to see the eclipse on August 21st if you're here in the US. Okay, before I go on, let me say that this week I haven't gotten to do much knitting, so I don't have anything, any finished objects to show you this week. So I'm just gonna move forward onto the library. A couple of weeks ago, I reviewed an audiobook entitled The Bookseller's Tale, which I had recently finished. It is the first book in a new series by Anne Swinfin, and the series is called The Oxford Medieval Mysteries. Now, so far, there are three books in this series, and I would say they fall within the cozy mystery genre. Like I said in the previous video, I enjoyed the first book enough that I wanted to read the next book in the series. And so I just recently finished that book. It is called The Novice's Tale. And again, the author is Anne Swinfin. So in the first book, we met Nicholas Elliott, the owner of a bookshop and an amateur sleuth. During the investigation of a murder of an Oxford student, he meets Emma Thorngold, uh, who is a cousin to the dead student. We find out that Emma is a gifted artist who is being confined in a convent against her will. So the second book, The Novice's Tale, focuses on Emma, who is known to the nuns as Sister Benedicta, a nun in training. So this book picks up right where the first left off. The scene is set when the Reverend Mother informs Emma that she has three weeks before she must take her final vows as a nun, which would mean that she would never be able to leave the Abbey. 
When Emma protests, she learns that her stepfather has given her to the Abbey as a gift to God, something she is not allowed to refuse. Now her friend Nicholas offers to help, but before he has a chance, Emma decides to escape the Abbey in the middle of the night. Before Nicholas can even start to search, the Abbey alerts Emma's stepfather, who arrives with his aggressive attack dogs to pursue and possibly even kill Emma. The battle is on between Nicholas and the evil stepfather as to who will find Emma first. But why is her stepfather hunting Emma down? What will happen if he succeeds in finding her first? Why did he force her into the convent in the first place? And can Nicholas act quickly enough to stop him? This novel retains the charming characters and setting that I became fond of in the first book, but the author also added some interesting changes. Instead of centering solely on Nicholas's point of view, we move back and forth between him and Emma. And the mystery to be solved here involves some fraud and deceit rather than murder. Once again, the historical perspective in this book is unique and the period details are great. Um, if you are a book lover, you couldn't ask for a better story. There are scribes, literary artists, and scholars in Oxford confronting evil and injustice. Now, in this book, I especially enjoyed learning about candle making and the very specific demands of the churches for the candles they commissioned. I also love the historical facts about inheritance laws and women's rights, or lack thereof. Um, although you can probably anticipate the ending, enough is going on to keep the story moving and to motivate you to continue reading. Um, overall, I thought the book was well-written and wholesome, just the way I like it. We get a fascinating glimpse into life in medieval England shortly after the plague decimated the population. There might be a little romantic overture, but no sex, no swearing, no major violence. Just a great story. Um, I'm going to give this one four stars. And the reader was the same person who read the first book, and that was Philip Batley. He did a great job, and I'm giving him five stars. Again, that book is The Novice's Tale by Anne Swinfin. Today I'm going to be talking about craft lighting. Now I've gotten several questions from viewers about what kind of lights I use for crafting, and just kind of general in general, what types of lights are the best. So I want to discuss the characteristics of lighting as well as the research on lighting and tell you what types of lights are recommended for things like reading, sewing, and knitting. And then I'll show you what kind of lights I have for crafting. Now, when you go to the store to buy light bulbs, you are faced with a huge number of choices. And if you pick up a box of light bulbs, you're presented with a lot of information that you might not be sure exactly what it means. Warm, soft light, 2700K, what's that? 1100 lumens, is that a lot? What does that mean? And what about watts, is that important? Well, let's talk about types of light bulbs and then go over these characteristics of indoor lighting. Now there are many different forms of lighting for household use. The standard incandescent light bulb has been the most popular light bulb for decades, but it's no longer being manufactured because there are new light bulbs that use less energy, produce less heat, and yield a brighter light in more accurate colors. One popular replacement light bulb is the compact fluorescent lamp or CFL. The CFL bulb consists of a tube that is swirled to produce a bulb approximately the same size as a conventional light bulb. These bulbs are a lot more expensive than the old light bulbs, but they're much more energy efficient and they last a long time so are way more cost effective. Another newer replacement for the incandescent light bulb is the LED bulb. An LED stands for light emitting diode. 
LED bulbs are very efficient and use even less electricity than CFL bulbs. LEDs have an impressive lifespan of over 20 years and are very cost effective. They're expensive, but think of the price as an investment. You will eventually recoup all of your costs and then some in energy savings, especially if you replace all of your older incandescent light bulbs around your house with these. LED light bulbs are dramatically cooler to the touch than other types of light bulbs. They do produce heat, but they're designed so that the heat is pulled away by a heat sink in the bottom, uh, in the base of the bulb. Um, from there, the heat dissipates into the air and the LED bulb stays cool, which helps it last a lot longer. Okay, so now that we've covered the incandescent, CFL, and LED bulbs, let's go over some specific characteristics that you should pay attention to when choosing your craft lighting. First is the color temperature of a light bulb, known as CCT, or correlated color temperature. Light is measured in Kelvin degrees, and this scale ranges from 1000 to 10,000 degrees Kelvin, which is abbreviated as K. So 1000 K is a lower color temperature and appears as a more reddish light, and 10,000 K is a higher color temperature and looks more blue. For example, candlelight is assigned a color temperature of 1800 K. 5000 to 6500 K is commonly accepted as the purest white light. It is equivalent to sunlight passing through a cloud, which scatters the wavelengths to make white light, is pleasing to the eye, and it's visually comfortable. The second aspect to consider is the brightness or the amount of light emitted by the light bulb. When shopping for bulbs, you're probably accustomed to looking for watts as an indication of how bright the bulb will be. But contrary to common belief, wattage is not an indication of brightness, but a measure of how much energy the bulb uses. Of course, there is a correlation between how much electricity a light bulb uses and how bright it is. For incandescents, it's pretty high correlation. But for CFLs and LEDs, the correlation is not that big, so for them, wattage is not a great predictor of how bright the bulb will be. So instead of focusing on wattage, a different form of measurement is used, and that's called lumens. The lumen is a measurement of brightness provided by a light bulb, and is the number you should look for when shopping for lighting. For comparison, a candle emits 12 lumens. The old 100 watt incandescent bulbs produce about 1600 lumens, and a new 32 watt CFL bulb emits 2000 lumens. So how many lumens do you need? Well, according to lighting experts, in a medium sized room, a total of 7000 to 8000 lumens is plenty. They say it's good to get several light bulbs totaling seven to 8,000 lumens and spread them around the room. As far as task lighting, the Illuminating Engineering Society recommends at least 1,000 to 1,400 lumens for intricate visual tasks like sewing, knitting, needlepoint, and other crafting like that. It's suggested that craft lighting should be twice as bright as light for reading. A third factor to consider is what's known as the Color Rendering Index, or CRI. This is the effect that a light has on the perceived color of an object. So it's like how accurate the color of objects appear to be under the light. And this is going to be really important in a lot of our crafting because oftentimes we are trying to assess the colors of something like yarn or fabric or thread or we're trying to match different yarns or fabrics to use together in a project. So the CRI scale goes from 1 to 100, and a higher rating means colors look more natural and accurate, while a low rating means the light is more likely to distort the color of objects. You can see this in this picture of strawberries. On the top is lower CRI lighting of about 70, and on the bottom is higher CRI lighting of 95. 
And as you can see, the colors on the bottom are much more vibrant and true to life. And you might have had that happen before in your life when looking at objects under different lighting. Here's an example that happened to me a couple of years ago. I finished this shawl, and here's a picture of it outside in natural light. As you can see, it's a light green in color. But here's what it looked like when I took a picture of it inside under an incandescent light. It looks orange. The color is not accurate at all. So when you're buying craft lighting, you want to look for bulbs with a CRI value of 80 or higher. So you get that accuracy in color perception. There's also a special kind of lighting that's specifically marketed to crafters, and that is full spectrum lighting. So let's take a look at this type of lighting for a moment. Now the term full spectrum was coined in the 1960s by Dr. John Ott, a photobiologist who developed what we now know as the Ott light. Full spectrum lights simulate the visible spectrum of natural light and also include ultraviolet radiation. Most full spectrum lights are marketed at a premium price over other types of lighting and they generally produce fewer lumens per watt than comparable light sources, but they're supposed to provide a long list of benefits that make your expensive purchase worthwhile. Now here are some of the benefits claimed to be associated with full spectrum lighting. Improves color perception, improves visual clarity, improves vitamin D synthesis in the body, improves mood, improves productivity, improves academic performance of students, improves mental awareness, improves symptoms associated with sleep disorders, improves symptoms associated with seasonal affective disorder, improves retail sales, and improves dental health. Now, that's quite a list, and who wouldn't want all that? The problem is that these advantages have mainly been promoted by marketers and the media. And because of this, surveys show that a majority of the public accepts these claims, believing that full spectrum lights are better than other light sources for health. But this might be a case of it sounds really great, but is there really any science backing it all up? Well, let's take a look at these claims and see if there's any research on them and what the results show. So let's start with the research on full spectrum lighting improving color perception. And this actually is supported by studies. Full spectrum lighting provides excellent color rendering with a CRI greater than 90. And remember, the scale is from 1 to 100 with higher values meaning more color accuracy. When color identification is part of the visual task, such as if you're an artist or a museum or a crafter like us, full spectrum lighting will ensure good color discrimination. So what about visual clarity? Does full spectrum lighting improve our ability to see things clearly? Well, there's no evidence that full spectrum lighting provides better visual performance than any other light source of the same brightness. But the thing is, people perceive full spectrum lighting to be brighter than other types of lights. This is probably because of a couple of things. One, full spectrum lights typically have a color temperature of 5000 to 7000 K, which produces greater brightness perception than lights with lower color temperatures. Also, the ultraviolet radiation produced by full spectrum lights has a brightening effect on textiles and paper. So even though actual vision is the same between full spectrum and other lighting, people think they can see better with full spectrum lighting. Now what about vitamin D synthesis? Does full spectrum lighting help our bodies produce vitamin D? Because after all, this lighting is supposed to be mimicking sunlight. So can we just sit under one of these lights and get our daily dose of vitamin D? Well, not so much. As you probably know, the human body manufactures vitamin D naturally from sunlight, and it takes as little as 15, 10 to 15 minutes in the sun for our bodies to produce vitamin D. But in this regard, 
full spectrum lighting doesn't seem to mimic the sun's intensity very well. In one study from 2002, eight hours under a full spectrum lamp produced a smaller ultraviolet dose than one minute spent outdoors in bright sunlight. Another study showed that it would take constant exposure to a full spectrum lamp for 30 hours to produce the amount of vitamin D our bodies need. So full spectrum lights really don't help with vitamin D synthesis. Now, some of the claims about full spectrum lights involve psychological benefits like improved mood and improved symptoms of seasonal affective disorder. Well, positive psychological outcomes have actually been observed in some studies, but it seems that there are no physical explanations for these benefits. It's more likely that people have positive associations with the natural environment. I mean, there's tons of studies showing that people prefer natural lighting over artificial lighting and natural environments to artificial environments. Um, and there's a lot of studies showing that natural environments produce more positive emotions than artificial environments. So it's likely that when people think a light is more natural, that this produces beneficial effects. In several studies, full spectrum lighting did improve people's mood and motivation, which could increase productivity and thus improve retail sales. So even though there's no physical reason for it, even if it's a placebo effect, if people think that full spectrum lights are more natural or better for them, then they're gonna report feeling better and that can translate into positive behaviors. Okay, so what about seasonal affective disorder? Well, this is a condition where people feel melancholy and depressed during times of the year when sunlight decreases. And for most people, that is during the winter months. And one of the most effective treatments for this disorder is exposure to bright light. So as far as specific treatment of seasonal affective disorder with full spectrum lights, they're actually no more effective than any other lights. What's important is that the light is a bright white and that it's placed at eye level for at least 30 minutes a day. Any light source with those characteristics will do the trick. Another claim is that full spectrum lighting helps decrease the symptoms of sleep disorders. Now this is a tricky one because in this case, the research shows that full spectrum lights could actually be bad. Lighting has a huge effect on the human circadian rhythm, which covers a multitude of daily cycles like sleeping and waking, and in, in fluctuations in mental awareness, mood, hormones, and other aspects of our daily activities. In particular, blue light is very effective at regulating the circadian system. Red light is not. But you have to be careful because nighttime exposure to blue light can alter the body clock and lead to a lot of health problems and sleep disorders. So to relieve sleep disorders, a light source should not mimic the full visual spectrum, but should maximize only the blue side of the spectrum and only during the daylight hours. Lastly, one of the health claims is that full spectrum lighting will improve dental health. Okay, that seems pretty random. What's the deal with that? Well, one study in 1992 reported that students in schools where full spectrum lighting had been installed had fewer dental cavities than students in schools with other types of lighting. And this study is widely cited by lighting manufacturers, of course, to prove how great full spectrum lighting is. But there are a number of problems with this study that call into question the interpretation of the results. First, the students were not randomly assigned to be exposed to full spectrum lighting or regular lighting. And the researchers didn't measure the prior incidence of dental cavities in any of the children. So it's possible that there were initial differences in dental health between groups that had nothing to do with the lighting. And second, there could be another potential confound in the study in that a lot of the students in the schools which had the full spectrum lighting had cavity-preventing dental sealants applied, 
So there was already a difference in dental care between the students in the two groups. So with this evidence, we can't really say if full spectrum lighting affects dental health. So overall, a review of studies over the past 50 years indicates that full spectrum lighting does not show dramatic effects on behavior or health. Even so, if you do a Google search for the benefits of full spectrum lighting, you will find these same claims of numerous benefits on dozens of different websites. Just remember that most of those supposed advantages are not supported by actual studies. And as I always remind my students, anybody can put anything on the internet. It's always a good idea to maintain healthy skepticism. Just be careful what objective evidence is available on the effectiveness of any product you, before you spend a lot of money on it. Now, that's not to say lighting is not important. It definitely is. It's just that there's probably nothing special about the full spectrum aspect of lighting, except that people think it's better because it's what they've been told. Whether you're reading, writing, sewing, knitting, or what have you, all can benefit from the use of proper task lighting. So I'm gonna summarize the characteristics of lighting that are important, and you can evaluate any light bulbs by looking at the information on the lighting labels. These labels are required by the US Federal Trade Commission to appear on light bulb packaging. They provide a quick summary of product information and allow you to make comparisons across different light bulb brands and types. So here's a summary of what characteristics you should be looking for when shopping for craft lighting. Number one, lumens. Remember that lumens indicates light output. The higher the number, the more light is emitted. And for craft lighting, you want to be looking for 1000 to 1400 lumens at least. Number two, correlated color temperature or CCT indicates the light color. Remember that cool colors have higher Kelvin temperatures and warm colors have lower temperatures, which is the opposite of what you would think, right? But cool white light is usually better for visual tasks like sewing, knitting, crocheting, and other crafting. Popular craft light brands like Otlight and Verilux have color temperatures of 5000 K because that has been shown to be a comfortable middle ground between two yellow and two blue. It's supposed to emulate sunlight filtered by clouds. Three, the color rendering index or CRI indicates the effect of the light on the color appearance of objects. Higher scores or higher numbers mean that the light bulbs illuminate colors more accurately and improve the true color perception. For craft lighting, look for CRIs of 80 or higher. And finally, you don't have to buy fancy, expensive, full spectrum lights. I mean, you can certainly get them if you want, but just keep in mind that you're probably not going to reap all the benefits that are claimed on the packaging. Any light that has the lumens, color temperature, and color rendering index you want is going to work equally well. The key is to know what makes the eye comfortable and least fatigued, and then to place the appropriate type of light in the right place. So a couple more things to consider. First, as you've probably noticed, your eyes change with age. The older you get, the more light you need for reading, knitting, and other tasks. Basically, the eye's need for more light increases 1% each year. Now, studies show that most house households are drastically under illuminated. So lighting experts recommend that you experiment with adding more light until you create an environment that is comfortable to you. Second, plan your entire room lighting as well as your specific task lighting. The optimal situation is a well-lit room full of comfortable ambient lighting where the task area is illuminated by a liberal focused pool of light. So that might be more than you ever wanted to know about lighting. Now I'll show you some of the craft lighting that I use and that I have in various places around my house. 
and I'm going to start with portable lighting. I have several different portable lights that I use in situations like when I'm traveling, riding on the train, in an airplane, or at home if the power goes out. The first one I've had the longest and have used the most, and it is an Otlight LED mini flip light. You can get these at craft stores and on Amazon for under $10. The light is small and battery operated, but it's extremely bright and that's what I like about it. The dimensions are two inches wide by three inches tall and it's one and a half inches deep. It has a sturdy clip on the back, so you can clip it to something solid. Um, it is too heavy to clip to your shirt because it would just make your shirt sag, but you could clip it to something like your belt, um, your purse, your book bag, your maybe your project bag, or if you're on an airplane, the seat pocket in front of you. I've even clipped it on top of my iPad. It comes on automatically when you flip it open and it shuts off when you close it. Now the lighting itself comes from 12 super bright LED lights. In addition to craft lighting, you could probably use this for a flashlight, a reading light, and I actually know people who take this to a quilt shop and use it for looking at fabric. It's nice because it's small, you can carry it in your pocket or your purse or a project bag. It takes three AAA batteries, which are inserted in a compartment in the back of the light. Now this is an LED light that is 2300 lumens, which is exceptionally bright. In fact, it's the brightest of all my craft lights, even brighter than the desk lamps and floor lamp that I have. Its color temperature is 5000 K with a CRI of 90 plus, so it's going to be a pretty pure white light that renders colors accurately. I really like this and I do use it a lot. Another portable craft light that I have is this neck light that I got from Amazon for $12.99. It consists of two pairs of LED lights housed in plastic cases. The lights are found at the end of these flexible wire arms that are covered with foam rubber. Each arm is about 10 inches long. Uh, it is battery operated and requires two AAA batteries, which are found in the plastic cover in the middle of the unit. You do have to unscrew some tiny screws to get to the battery compartment. And this plastic piece can go behind your neck, so it's got a soft velvety pad on it. As I said, each arm has two LED lights inside the plastic casing, one is a spotlight and one is a wide angle light. You turn the lights on by pressing the button on each case. The first push will turn on the wide angle. The second push will turn on the spotlight and the third push will turn them both on. And then press the button again to turn them both off. So you can turn on one, two, three, or all four lights at the same time. Now because the arms are flexible wire, you can configure the lights in all kinds of ways. You can hang it around your neck like this and adjust the lights. You can hook it on something. You can set it on a surface to focus the light upward or downward. Now this light is handy, but it's not nearly as bright as the little Ot light flip light that I just showed you. This one is only 50 lumens, so it's not that bright. It is a neat gadget, very lightweight, and convenient to use hands-free. My third portable light source is this little bendable LED flashlight. I got this one from Nancy's Knit Knacks years ago, and I don't think they are selling them anymore, but you can get the same thing on Amazon for under $20. It's battery operated and has a magnet on the bottom so you can attach it to something metal. Now mine has a little clip on the side where you can attach it to your project bag or your pocket. The light is about 150 lumens. I think this one is good to use if you're knitting at a movie theater and you need to turn on a little light to check something out. 
Um, this one is not super bright, so it would be a little more discreet than a bright light like the Ot Light Flip Light. Um, I like the little adjustable neck. And again, it's small enough to toss into your purse or project bag. So those are three little portable craft lights that I have. Now I'll show you several lamps that I have around the house that I use for crafting. The first one is a large desk lamp that I have here in my craft room. It's right over here. And it's the Otlight Flex Arm Plus. And it's quite large. It is adjustable from 20 to 27 inches tall. It has a weighted base, so it's pretty heavy. It also does come with a big clamp, so you can attach it to a table or something like that, but I just have it set up on the base. Now this was the first Ot light that I ever got, and I really love it. It's nice and bright. It has Its bulb is 1100 lumens, and like all Ot lights, the color temperature is 5000 K. And it's got a CRI over 90. So these are all within the recommended craft lighting characteristics that I just talked about. So my craft room general lighting is that I have two windows. I have one there, one back there, um, and they have shears over them to filter the natural light. For ceiling lighting, I have a pretty chandelier that my husband bought me, and that has bright LED candelabra lights in it. And then I have this Ot light on my desk, kind of coming up over the top of my computer. It's been a great setup in my craft room, and I've worked very comfortably here. Now, next door in my sewing room, there are also two windows that provide natural light. On my cutting table, I have two adjustable clamp lights, and each of them has a 13 watt Ot light bulb in it and that is 750 lumens each. So together they're 1500 lumens, and that is great for seeing the fabric when I'm cutting it. I also have two Otlight desk lamps next to my sewing machine. One is the 18 watt lamp, and that lights up my sewing table. And that is 1100 lumens, which is plenty for that area. Then right in front of my sewing machine is the Slimline task lamp. This is 750 lumens, which just adds to the brightness of the light of my sewing machine. So the lighting around my sewing machine is great and perfectly comfortable for working in there. And then lastly, in that room, I have a floor lamp that illuminates my ironing board. This light is not an Ot light, but an off-brand that I picked up at a local store, and it's about 1750 lumens. Now, the only other craft lighting I have in the house is in the family room where I have an Ot light floor lamp next to my recliner chair. I often sit there and knit, and this floor lamp has been perfect. As you can see, I also have a regular lamp with a light bulb of around 900 lumens, and the floor lamp has 1100 lumens. So altogether, there's plenty of light for me to see what I'm doing, and this is another setup that has worked well for me. Now, even though I've mentioned Ot lights a lot in this video, I'm certainly not promoting that particular brand or encouraging anyone to only purchase that brand. I've bought them because I like the color temperature and the brightness of them. They are expensive, but I've never paid full price for one. All of the Ot lights I have, I got on sale with a coupon or on Black Friday, and I've always gotten them at least 50% off. But anyway, those are the craft lights that I use in my house. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. I hope you found it useful to hear about the important characteristics of lighting and what you should be looking for if you're in the market for craft lights. So what kind of craft lighting do you have? And what about portable craft lighting? Do you find your lighting to be satisfactory when you're crafting, or do you wish you had something different? Do you have any tips or ideas that I didn't cover today? Did you learn anything new about lighting? Um, I hope you join in the conversation by sharing your thoughts and reactions in the comment section below. I really enjoy hearing from you. And of course, as always, please leave a comment if you have any questions about today's show, if you have a topic idea for a future video, or if you'd like to see a product tested, leave your suggestions in the comment section below because I would love to hear your thoughts. I also want to remind everyone that you can find links to everything I've talked about today in the description box below this video. 
Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and I'll see you in the next video. So next week I'm planning something fun and a little different and that is to show some gift ideas for knitters. I know some of you are already starting to shop for Christmas plus it's never too early to start thinking about gift ideas and I hey people always have birthdays. And I've been picking up some really cool items that would be perfect for my knitting friends or for myself. Anyway, I'm really excited to share some things with you and hope that you'll join me for that next week. And until then, stay smart and have a sparkly week. <laughs>